You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. A crowd, 25 to 30 people wide, many of them in their office suits and briefcases, marched down the street towards the Russian White House. Placards that said, down with the Communist Party, no to red fascism. It happened in such a way that looked like a concerted effort. It becomes clear now that this must be the center. A veteran of the Afghanistan war spreads the word. If you want to stop tanks, I know the best way to stop a tank is iron construction rod. And it just so happens. This is Moscow. There's plenty of unfinished construction. There just happens to be a large construction site next to the Russian White House that's unfinished. Logs from a nearby park, concrete and iron from the construction site, and others nearby were quickly looted. As one observer says, Guess who was carrying the first logs and blocks? The women, of course. Then the men joined. Have you ever wondered how inbred the Habsburgs really were? What women in the past used for birth control? Or what Queen Victoria's nine children got up to? On the History Tea Time podcast, I profile remarkable queens and LGBTQ plus royals, explore royal family trees, and delve into women's medical history and other fascinating topics. Join me every Tuesday for History Tea Time, wherever fine podcasts are enjoyed. Son, here is a candy bar. Eat it, please, the woman says to the tank commander. Against the rules he said, gripping his Kalashnikov. A half minute passed. Okay, put it in my pocket. Fast. Into his pocket went a piece of chocolate, and then others did the same to the very tanks that seemed, seemed to be surrounding the square to crush them or scare them or limit their size, whatever it is that they wanted to do. They offered cigarettes, sandwiches, To these young men from outside Moscow, a few who couldn't talk, who wouldn't talk, but others who said that they had no idea why they were there in Moscow. A few said they got orders to prevent a left-wing coup. What is clear, and what we made clear in the last episode, is that citizens of Moscow, now the Soviet Union, woke up to tanks and tank-like armored personnel carriers in the residential and occupational streets. Eight men, high officials, have detained Gorbachev, the USSR president, and they say he is sick and assumed power. Yeltsin, the president of the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic, which is most of the landmass of the Soviet Union, has stood on a tank and issued decrees, although at this time, few have seen it. Something is changing, though. Like Yeltsin, actually, before Yeltsin even set the example, citizens are jumping up on tanks as well. They are marking them with chalk. They are blocking their way. Tanks are surrounded by workers, sometimes children. But in a lot of cases, all they're doing is trying to engage them, to talk to them. Fraternization is underway, notes a visiting professor from UC Berkeley, Victoria Bonnell. Very young men with Central Asian or Ukrainian names imprinted on their ammunition pouches stood mute, but hostile at first. The reaction of citizens was mixed. Shame on you, some said. Yeltsin was elected. Don't you stand for him? One wrote, put Yazov, the defense minister, on trial. They wrote it in chalk on the ground. They even wrote it on some of the armed personnel carriers. And some brave babushkas, Soviet grandmothers, jumped on the tanks. An old mother said, I've nurtured you, and this is what you do to me. Many of the soldiers respond, I won't shoot people. I will not. We are not armed. See empty magazines. Oh, I've heard about your empty magazines. Shame on the Communist Party. An old man was scolding. I worked all my life to pay for this army, and now you are shooting at me? This idea of just the sweetness, the fraternization, the friendliness, the blot, 
but a lot of conversations were more chaotic. Sweet young women handing flowers with babushkas yelling and scolding at the same time. We should not assume either that everyone heard everyone. Some people couldn't get out of their tank units at the time. Many tank crews are starting to get the word, try not to get to inner city. Don't get bogged down in those streets because people are going to jump on your tanks. You'll never be able to move. You'll be stuck there all day. Our photographer, Alexander Zemlyanichenko, said, I spent a chaotic day taking photographs of protesters around Yeltsin's headquarters and running back to the office to have my rolls of film developed. Yes, this is the pre-digital age. Some of his pictures, his best ones, are of citizens and soldiers shaking hands. Some of the tank crews got out of their vehicles and declared they would side with the protesters. Here's Ian Elliott. Within seconds, the snorting tanks with flak-jacketed soldiers on top, clutching their Kalashnikovs, were surrounded by people from the meeting, determined to educate soldiers about how they were being misled. Confused and unhappy, the soldiers and tank crews listened to a range of hecklers. From lectures on democracy to the only drunk I was to see among hundreds of thousands of demonstrators against the junta. Ripping open his shirt and thrusting his naked chest against the muzzle of a Kalishnikov in the hands of a nervous teenager, the drunk shouted, You won't shoot us, will you? We're Russian, and you're Russian after all. Now, a point to be made here, that's largely true of most of the Soviet tank crews, except as Victoria Brunel noticed... Some of them were being sent from Central Asian regions, and it was thought that Defense Minister Yazov, who is one of the coup plotters, was picking those units in particular because they wouldn't have that Slav-to-Slav connection. None of this should belie that intimidation. The Oman or the um, military police did not give citizens the time of day like this tank crew did. In terms of excitement, going out in a car towards Red Square and seeing a column of tanks coming over the hill was the closest thing you get to being in a John Wayne movie. The cavalry of the bad guys. Meanwhile, in the Krachatov Institute, that new computer system we described, they have Yeltsin's decrees, and they are able to post them to a place called talk.politex.sovietusenet, which is going around the world. They're already receiving messages from foreign countries, and they send a message out to the various Soviet universities that are connected on the network. Tell us what you see. And there are immediate replies now, instantaneous from all around the world, voices of support. Tell us, everyone, and throughout the Soviet Union, what you see. We're not going to overexcite the American people or the world. People are not happy with President Bush's response to the coup. We're not going to overexcite the American people or the world, and so we will conduct our diplomacy in a prudent fashion, not driven by excess, not driven by extreme. He's going to step up the tone later in the day. A lot of people are going to criticize this statement. And he has just come back about three weeks previous from visiting the Soviet Union and doing an unprecedented visit to Ukraine. But he gave a speech to almost admonished Ukraine not to leave the Soviet Union. At least it seemed that way, or was terribly neutral for an American president. It was labeled a chicken Kiev speech. So Bush consults. I mean, that's what made him famous, his foreign policy skills. He's going to consult with a number of leaders. But it's not like everyone thinks Bush did everything right during these days. More of that later. Right now, I think there isn't much he can do immediately except to keep demanding the stoic Kremlin operators that he be put through to Gorbachev. He also talks to Velkov Havel, the president of Czechoslovakia. Yeltsin is elected by tens of millions. That's a good argument to make, Havel tells him. Havel himself has gone from living in a communist country to now being an elected leader. I know Yaneyev, Havel says to Bush. Bush cuts him off a bit. So do I. And I like him. But you get the sense that he wasn't hearing what Havel wanted to say. Havel tells him, Yaneyev, he pretends to be jovial. He's totally gray. Now, Bush, I am of the same opinion. He's the puppet of the KGB army, Havel insists. Everyone needs to keep asking for Gorbachev. It's all we can do. 
Bush talks to the Hungarian president. Like the Czech president, Bush is encouraged to work with Yeltsin. He dodges a request to call for independence of the Baltic states, but ever the statesman, he does not say no to it. After all, the United States has never officially recognized that the Baltic states were part of the Soviet Union. He says to the Hungarian president, Just for the heck of it, I placed a call to Gorbachev. They put me to an operator. From this transcript, we read that maybe Bush thinks the situation's hopeless for him. He may not be talking to Gorbachev again. But nonetheless, he is now convinced, after talking to these various leaders, that they need to keep calling Gorbachev. Something else is going on today. There's a meeting of the Congress of Foreign Soviet Citizens. Yes, this day, the 19th, happens to be the day that they're meeting. It's a Monday. It's the beginning of business. It's pretty clear uh, they're supposed to hear from Yeltsin. He's supposed to speak to this group. But for obvious reasons, Yeltsin does not. Rumors swell among the hundreds of people in this body, and they are people from outside the country, including Americans who are Soviet citizens living abroad, coming back to visit. It's new that there's even a Congress of these people, that they would even have a meeting. Now that they do, they're unsure what to do, who to side with. Rumors swell. Gorbachev is dead. Democracy is over, says one speaker. And this is a Russian who's visiting from the United States. It's at this point when another member of the Congress of Foreign Soviet Citizens, Sergei Petrov, a Russian who is living in Harbin, China, is so annoyed by the pessimism of this crowd. It's a mixture of apathy and pessimism, and he doesn't like either one. But he keeps to himself. Until the leader of the Congress of Foreign Soviet Citizens says, Let's have a moment of silence for Gorbachev. And Petrov says, I don't know what came over me. A moment of silence? He shouts out, It is too early to bury Gorbachev. It is too early to write off Yeltsin. And his scream in this crowd of hundreds is met by silence followed by just a few claps, then a few concerned. He hears another voice shout out from the other end of the room, That is confrontational. But then enough say, Yes, and join in in a cheer. We need a declaration. We need a declaration. A declaration of support for Yeltsin. It is agreed in that Soviet way that eventually they will issue a declaration of support after they adjourn and re-meet for a few more speeches. That declaration will be issued the next day. Actions are happening throughout the republics, not just in Russia, but Russia is the galvanizing because even the Ukrainian deputy says the fact that Yeltsin spoke from a tank today is an indicator. The Estonian government issues a statement about the attempted coup d'etat, says that what's happening, removing Mikhail Gorbachev from power is happening contrary to international law. It could be the first time in history of the Soviet Union an American Sovietologist might be onto something. In Chechnya, the delegates of the first Chechen National Congress gather in Grozny and proclaim themselves the all national congress of the Chechen people. If they can declare a committee, so can we. In Turkmenistan, rallies are being prepared in labor collectives, where Russians predominantly work in support of Yeltsin. At Belarus, a meeting of the parliamentary opposition begins, which calls for not obeying the orders of the state emergency committee. As reports come in for a medical report or a doctor to speak, can someone, okay, if he's ill, how about we get Gorbachev's doctor to speak? The emergency committee issues a statement saying that Gorbachev was simply resting. Phones are very active throughout Moscow. A Soviet journalist is called by a foreign journalist and says, I have an inkling this coup isn't going to work. What makes you say that? We are afraid, the Soviet journalist says, because I am talking to you on the phone, the man in Vienna said. They hadn't cut the phones yet. Yet, she probably thought. As would happen, the office phones and home phones throughout Moscow, many of them were being listened to. The ubiquitous Swan Lake broadcast that had happened in the morning switched to other announcements. The committee starts saying more. There will be a crackdown, Tass announces. A crackdown on crime. There will be a hardline approach against crime, especially economics crimes, by the Russian mob, which the emergency committee blamed 
on increasing trade with the West. With trade with the West and reform came more crime. That'll sound good to many years. No one likes criminals. Criminals in Soviet study, I mean, it's kind of like here, right? You see movies about the mob, though. <laughs> Some of our movies are more favorable to the mob, I suppose. But, uh, you know, we, we have our, our G-men as good guys and law enforcement officers as good, my, good guys, too. I don't want to make this exclusively Soviet. But there was something strong in Soviet society, a lot of, like, cartoons where the villains would be these criminals who were stealing things. And certainly that was a focus of attention in the culture. A lot of people thought that perestroika was theft. But the committee's definition of crime is pretty broad. Draft decrees not broadcasted but later discovered would have allowed military and police patrols to join, have military patrolling the streets for criminal matters, and to shoot, quote, hooligans, including possibly pro-democracy demonstrators, by their own orders. And now when Yeltsin calls for Gorbachev's return, he can hear it. Though blocked in most communications, Gorbachev's bodyguard has jerry-rigged a radio. He hears the BBC. He hears Air American radio from Foros. However, to hear Gorbachev's account, this is scary. They're saying I'm ill when I'm not ill. Maybe they're going to make me ill. His bodyguards loyally followed the instruction to at least have their bosses talk to Gorbachev. Now they make a decision. They're going to follow their orders to protect him. Because they're just not sure. In the confusion, let's our mission is to protect Gorbachev and his family in Foros. And they tell him, Mr. President, don't eat anything that comes in. Fortunately, there's supplies that had already been in the house. Live off that. Don't eat any new things that come in. They're afraid of poisoning. And we will guard the door. It would later come out that the plot may have been hatched in a steam bath, which is not shocking, of course. Good things happen in Banyas in Russia normally. Why, it's the best thing for you. A steam bath. Long day at the factory. Just had too much to drink yesterday. Jump in the Proyuval Banya. Baths were everywhere in your factory, in your union hall, in the government buildings, and of course the private homes of the elite people, the nomenclature, that top one or two percent of the country. Here's from the Times. The plot was hatched at a bathhouse in downtown Moscow at mid-morning on Saturday, August 17, 1991. The head of the KGB, Vladimir Kryuchkov, summoned five senior Soviet officials for a highly secretive meeting that he told them would be vital for the future of the USSR. Wrapped in towels in the steam room, and later, while cooling down over vodka and scotch, the half-dozen diehard communist apparatchiks outlined a plan to overthrow the Soviet government. For the Soviet spymaster, the prime minister, the defense minister, paunchy, half-naked co-conspirators, the stakes could not have been higher. And they had to act quickly. But no matter your class, in an ostensibly classless society, steam is part of it. In a high-end area of Moscow, the KGB had a steam house, and there, the committee of men met and planned to do something about the new treaty of the Union and this troublesome leader, Yeltsin. Key people are involved. The supplier of the industrial complex of the USSR, the defense secretary, and most importantly, Kryuchkov, the head of the KGB. They didn't bring in the vice president, Yanayevna, yet. He was too shaky. He'd be told the day right before when there was very little he could do. The Union was still filled with enemies, without all the warheads, still pointed in their direction, from America and without. The breakaway talk, all those rebelling republics, look at what's going on in Yugoslavia right now, they would point to. We lost Eastern Europe. We were part of a great empire. These are the arguments that are going to be made. You know, if the United States is so peaceful and friendly, why are the warheads still pointed at? Why are they still manipulating other countries and not to our benefit? Why are they trying to break up our union? 
I don't believe anymore. A letter in Argumenti e Facti newspaper, which years before Glasnos has always had an edge, has always printed letters from people that were critical. But this one says, I don't believe anymore. What sort of government is it that allows only selected people to live normal family lives? People in authority have everything, dachas and money, and others have nothing. I no longer believe. Nineteen eighty nine in Red Square, in sight of the orbs of the Kremlin, a few women and men do something radically illegal. They raise a flag, a red, white, and blue flag of Russia, more specifically, because the Royal Eagle is removed. It's the red, white, and blue flag of the very short lived nineteen seventeen provisional democratic government of Russia. Immediately, they feel the boots and the punches. The beefy fur-hatted militia, these budding Democrats are punched and kicked and thrown into a van. Ignore history and you lose an eye. Forget history and you lose two eyes. That's a common saying. Unheard of things, unsuitable things were happening in the Soyuz. Siberian miners are making demands. Spontaneously, it happens. They want no more long shifts. They want no more broken mine equipment. Tens of thousands of miners stop working. In the 50s, we know how this ends. With the leaders in the gulag, and maybe more in the 70s, nay, even in the 80s, we know the story. They get roughed up, jailed, fired. Some in the asylum. But it happens now. And the Siberians are joined by Ukrainians and eventually by miners in Kazakhstan complaining about their miserable apartments, complaining about needing more combat pay, and also this. They have no soap to wash off the coal dust and grime, so they go to sleep dirty. And in this workers' paradise, the unions are no help. They're in cahoots with the Communist Party and the government. In past years, this would not be listened to, but now it must be. The USSR reacts with promises of more pay for workers to investigate some of the problems. And that soap Miners report never seeing so much soap. A strong man speaks. Once he was the world's weightlifting champion. Now he is in the USSR People's Congress. Yuri Vlasov won the super heavyweight division at the 1960 Summer Olympics in Rome. He's the man who showed that communism was better. He still believes in socialism, but his opinion on many other things have changed. The KGB is the most closed organization we have, he shouts to the other delegates and on TV screens across the Soviet Union. The most closed organization we have. They have no business with an office in the center of Moscow. It is an underground empire. He's 54 years old now, but he's still big, six foot six, large hands and muscles the arms and legs of a lumberjack. A newspaper said, with his beard, long sleeve wool shirt, cocky pants and sandals, he would seem more at home in the forest swinging an axe. But he now speaks to the people's deputies. The Communist Party is impotent. Gorbachev is a tyrant. The secret police, the Lubyanka building in Moscow was a disgrace. And the site where they tortured and tormented people as a rule, the best the pride and light of our people must be shut down. Unheard of. In the same year, men and women holding hands engaged in song in Estonia, a Baltic SSR of the Soviet Union. Moscow authorities have attempted to remove phosphorus from Estonia's rich resources in a haphazard and environmentally damaging way. What can they do? Sing. In unison, holding hands, singing folk songs, Estonian folk songs that are banned. But how can two million people commit a crime when they do it all at once? 1990 sees the worst thing, a bread shortage in the country. For people who are in their 80s or 90s who know World War II and life there, the starvation, 
This is all too familiar. It's time to bury some bread, they say. In Leningrad, there's something worse. A tobacco riot when cigarettes are not on the shelves. It's a dangerous situation until cigarettes can be trucked in. In 1990s, Victory Day Parade, after the demonstration of Soviet military might, Gorbachev and aides go to approach the tomb of Lenin. But the Moscow city authorities have now allowed a new thing, protesters. And they shout at Gorbachev, shame on you. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. If you enjoy bizarre true stories, then the Useless Information Podcast is the podcast for you. For example, did you know that author Robert Louis Stevenson gave his birthday away? Or that there was a football team that played for six years before someone realized that the school never, ever existed? Or that a dog in upstate New York was once placed on trial for murder? Well, to hear these and hundreds of additional fascinating true stories from the flip side history, be sure to check out the Useless Information Podcast. That's the Useless Information Podcast, podcasting worldwide since 2008 and available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. Be sure to check it out. Everyone was free speaking, so it seems, saying what they want under Gorbachev's new glasnost and perestroika policy. Glasnost publicity. They, we say openness, but actually the word is publicity, getting things out there, and also perestroika reform at the same time. Everyone is speaking, including Gorbachev. He calls the country's war in Afghanistan the bleeding wound, scolds the generals for spending too much money, losing too many men, and lying to people. Authors that were previously banned are now published even the Gulag Archipelago is published. No one can believe some of the things. Andrei Sakharov, the peace-urging nuclear scientist, imprisoned in the early 80s, is released by order of Gorbachev's pen. Not only is he free to speak, he becomes a people's deputy. But Glasnost, this openness, goes both ways. If Democrats can speak, so can heads of the KGB. Khrushchev, is the KGB's leader, and he speaks to the Supreme Soviet, a kind of mixture of a Congress and a Supreme Court, with all power, but no fair election. And yet, he warns that the U.S. and the CIA are working to undermine the Soviet Union and supporting anti-Soviet groups in the country. Lithuania declares its sovereignty from the Soviet Union in early 1991. A group designed to protect the new government holds the TV station. In Azerbaijan, and Armenia, there's ethnic violence. In Georgia, Soviet troops use gas to settle a riot in Tbilisi. Soviet troops are sent into all of these situations, and blood is spilled. An open election is held in the largest part of the Soviet Union, the Russia SSR. Boris Yeltsin is elected president of Russia. He is a Democrat. He is, in principle, a Democrat. would like to see more than one party in Russia. Gorbachev is angry at him. And he is angry at Gorbachev. No love lost there from old bureaucratic squabbles. He visits the United States, Yeltsin, and he meets with President Bush. Former President Nixon visits the Soviet Union and meets with Gorbachev and also Yeltsin. Nixon is 
not always popular in America, but has value to President Bush as an emissary. Nixon says Gorby's a fighter. But Yeltsin is Main Street to Gorby's Wall Street. He wants Bush to pay more attention to him. At a Politburo meeting on the Georgia incident, a videotape will be produced and is watched by the members. Not only are Soviet troops using gas to dispel the crowd, they attack them with sharp shovels, killing a woman. The troops appear drugged. Gorbachev wants the leaders of the free world to pay attention to what he's doing in the Soviet Union. And there is a G7 meeting, and Gorbachev is invited by Margaret Thatcher, George Bush, and Helmut Kohl to visit this summit. But he expects money. And he's promised within the Soviet Union that he can get money from foreign countries. $100 billion is his request. The Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney, urges the other countries they should give this request. But Cole, Thatcher, and Bush are hesitant. It's one thing to support reforms. It's one thing to praise leadership in the Soviet Union. But giving billions of dollars to a former enemy in the Cold War not quite over yet. They hesitate. Gorbachev comes back empty-handed. It's noted by his KGB chief, Khrushchev. I told you so. Decades later, Gorbachev will say that this action undermined him more than any other. The only thing he could tell hardliners and liberals at the time that kept him in office was that he could deal with the West. And dealing with the West, with openness with Glasnost, would benefit the country financially. Andrei Sakharov, as we said, uh, Gorbachev had freed recently and was now a people's deputy. And he uses his free speech and his popularity and makes a stunning proposal. Let's make the Communist Party no longer the exclusive power in the USSR. In a country where communism is really many scholars argue, the national religion, where people have to repeat statements. Students have to read texts that are not unlike prayers every day. To say the Communist Party should no longer lead the nation is blasphemy. He approaches Gorbachev with a proposal in his hand, with papers. Gorbachev on live TV bats them away. Get those papers away from me. In Ukraine, a reporter, Svetlania Alexandria, starts gathering interviews of people near the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. It's obvious to most of Ukraine and many in Russia that the story of the 1986 nuclear disaster is not anywhere near what they were told on the TV, and that the degree of radiation leak was much higher, and that the steps to contain it were paltry. Soviet authorities lied every step of the way. More people died, poisoned, and received dangerous doses of radiation than were ever stated. Gorbachev has used Chernobyl to push his perestroika reforms, to get them to happen faster. But he doesn't escape blame. Gorbachev has removed troops from Eastern Europe, frustrating conservatives in the country. We in the United States saw a lot of the withdrawal from Afghanistan in 1989. But this is another withdrawal that was noted within the USSR. He's also removed troops from the 4,000-mile border with China. Early in 1991, Gorbachev's once loyal foreign minister, and a man well liked in the West, warns of a coup. A dictator is coming, he says, and he resigns his position as foreign secretary. Six months after the televised confrontation with Sakharov, where Gorbachev pushed his proposal away, Sakharov is dead of a heart attack. He is the closest thing to a saint in the Soviet Union, many said. A nuclear scientist who warned against war with the West, who pushed for peace. Unfortunately for Gorbachev, one of the last televised images anyone saw of Sakharov was Gorbachev pushing the papers away from him. Here's what Masha Gessen says. By humiliating Sakharov on television, Gorbachev went too far. Sakharov was perceived as a martyr. Gorbachev was perceived as his tormentor. There's a huge rally in Leningrad, now renamed St. Petersburg. The last memory many have of Sakharov is that image. Masha Gessin makes a point that I cannot ignore 
that the KGB seems like it was designed just for a day, like August 1991. I've heard it also described that the KGB is something like a time bomb within the Soviet system in case the official government apparatus fails. The KGB is there. Yeah, Gessen makes the point. It's just designed for coups. It has its claws in every aspect of life. There are various directories and departments of the KGB. Now, some think that this isn't this is too strong. Um, Joseph Weisberg in his book, and again, he's the producer of the Americans TV show, feels that it was more giant bureaucracy than evil Bohemoth. This is countered by those like Yevgeny Albitz, who had been studying the KGB all of her journalistic career, had sources within the agency, had ferreted out a few good agents who had talked to her and some really bad ones that had done some really bad things. To her, the KGB was a state within a state. That isn't some crazy reference just from her. The quote is from Khrushchev. Napoleon Bonaparte rose from obscurity to become the most powerful and significant figure in modern history. Over 200 years after his death, people are still debating his legacy. He was a man of contradictions, a tyrant and a reformer, a liberator and an oppressor, a revolutionary and a reactionary. His biography reads like a novel, and his influence is almost beyond measure. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast, and every month I delve into the turbulent life and times of one of the greatest characters in history, and explore the world that shaped him in all its glory and tragedy. It's a story of great battles and campaigns, political intrigue, and massive social and economic change, but it's also a story about people populated with remarkable characters. I hope you'll join me as I examine this fascinating era of history. Find The Age of Napoleon wherever you get your podcasts. Hello everyone, it's Takuyi here. And I'm Gabby. And we are the hosts of History of Everything, a podcast which you can probably guess by the name is, well, I mean, it's about everything. Do you want to know why people thought potatoes were evil and would give you syphilis? Are you curious about all the stories of the terrible and stupid ways that people have kicked the bucket over the years? Do you want to hear tales about all of the different badasses of history and the lives that they had brought to life? Well, if so, then look no further. History of Everything is just the right podcast for you. It's available on Spotify, Pandora, and anywhere else that you get your podcast from. Join us for some fun and just see how weird and wacky history can be. All but says, whenever I hear Americans that tell me, oh, the KGB is just the same as our FBI or CIA, I just stop talking to them. They have... No idea. No comparison. The KGB is involved in every aspect of political life. When they tell me, oh, we've had investigations like Watergate and Abscam, political investigations, no comparison. But were they perfect? Not on August 19th, 1991. Nearly everyone thinks that's the case. But things seemed so different under perestroika. And indeed, even the new head of the KGB, Koryuchkov, was celebrated at the time of his appointments as a new kind of leader, one that would protect the budding Russian reforms. He played the Western press. He told the Italian magazine La Unita that notions in Western press that the KGB is conservative or reactionary force are unsubstantiated. He tried to portray the KGB now as a kind of super police force with a mandate to combat rising crime. He's a different breed, the liberal weekly magazine Agnonyok said. You ask the man a question, and he seems to give you a straight answer. Straight answer didn't always mean a good answer, some thought. During his confirmation hearings uh, in the Supreme Soviet, Alexander Perjabinek, a former political prisoner and human rights activist, who was still having trouble with the KGB when he tried to distribute his underground newspaper, even in the era of perestroika, Kryachov is engaged in high-level pokazuka, 
the Russian word for fakery, designed to impress outsiders. In all his interviews, you'll notice he avoids the most obvious issues, the structure of the KGB, its functions or activities, and the whole history of its association and direction of spying, imprisonment, and murder of political opponents. Boris Yeltsin said, it's all camouflage and not real openness. To present the story one way is to not do justice to what's going on on the ground. You have to understand that we in America often saw the Soviet Union black box that it was for us as pretty homogenized when there was a lot of variance in opinion. For instance, it's not just democratic fighters against the evil KGB, say, instance in these events. Uh, As much as there was a revolution going on in 89, 90, and 91 in the USSR, there was also counter-revolution. Members of the army, members of the KGB, political conservatives in the USSR were pushing back against reforms. There was a meeting in the 1990 November Supreme Soviet where after a crackdown of the protest in Georgia and those Soviet troops being blamed in the video, an officer appears on TV Almost a kind of Soviet Ali North. Glasnost is worse than Stalin, he said. People can accuse you of anything. Mass media can defame you with no argument, no justification. How can we keep an army this way? Army uh, officers are starting to report that they can't recruit anyone. The people are spitting on army units. There's all of these stories that they're lighting fire to bases and, and things like that, throwing rocks at As morning turns into afternoon, there's a shift. Word spreads. You need to get to the Russian White House, not Red Square, where all these tanks are and we're bottled up. Get to the White House to protect the leader, the obvious leader here, Yeltsin. The rumor spreading across Moscow and over the telephones is that the Russian White House will be stormed at 1600. That's four o'clock, August 19th. Why the KGB or Soviet government would pick an exact beginning of an hour to attack is not sure, but the street mind is very sure of it. Victoria Bonnell says, By 2 p.m. I came out of the Lenin Library. I saw a crowd of people moving towards Manish Square, up Kalinian Prospect. Their arms were locked, maybe 25 to 30 persons wide, and several hundred long, thousands of people. They have placards in their hands. Down with the Communist Party, down with the plotters. Many were well-dressed and had suits and carried briefcases. Here's Dr. Ian Elliott of Radio Liberty. The troop transporters, which were trying to force their way through the makeshift barrier on the bridge in front of the Russian White House and in a dangerous operation, turned around amidst the crowds before disappearing in the direction of the Ukraine Hotel. A frustrated soldier inside one of the transporters fired a few rounds into the air. Later, a column of several dozen light tanks came charging recklessly around the corner at the Smolensk metro station, their officers desperately waving passerbys out of the way, but clearly determined not to relinquish their speed for fear of finding themselves pinned down like so many others. Nonetheless, someone managed to scrawl with a piece of chalk on tank number 073, Liberty, not tanks. A veteran of the Afghanistan war in front of the White House spreads the word. The best thing for stopping tanks are large iron construction rods that link concrete. He knows his tank had been stopped many times in that operation. Taxicab drivers will also join contributing vehicles to this mass. There's no rumors. Gas attacks are imminent. People emerge from the Russian state building not wanting to be trapped by poison gas that almost certainly will be put inside. But it's raining, and it's difficult. Some masks are distributed. Some masks are distributed, but they're cotton and gauze masks. Not really enough to stop tear gas. The Russian state government workers and officials and the deputies who inside see the people outside now and are inspired. So, Remember, this is just a day of work, August 19th, 1991, for Soviet employees of the Russian SSR. They're employees, but when they start seeing the people outside, they're getting inspired, and they're coming out in some cases to join. But at first, there's this odd mix of people in the building and people out, and they're not even going to have a public address system until the next day. The only way they can communicate is to throw leaflets out the window from the top floor of the building. Here's what we want you to do. So the first people to start this are those protesters that arrive in front. 
What else can we use to stop tanks? We uprooted a telephone booth. We were very sorry later when we had to go far to make calls. Someone commandeers a milk truck and drives it to the emerging barricades. The driver is not happy. You idiots, I'll have to pay for that. Another shoes a bus driver out of his vehicle and assumes his controls. He's never driven a bus before in his life. He shouts, get out of the way, please. I don't know what I'm doing. And with others directing passerby to get out of the way, he delivers the bus and adds this vehicle to the heaping pile of metal. It was a desperate plea from then-Russian leader Boris Yeltsin that drew Gennady Veratilny to the barricades. I wasn't a supporter of Yeltsin. I wasn't a liberal or a communist. I wasn't a party man. But the appeal by Yeltsin for freedom, for democracy, all of these words inspired me. They're arriving from work or from their colleges, coming in drips and drabs, then larger numbers, finally thousands. The emotion was all embracing. These were ordinary men and women, some mere schoolboys, others gnarled working men, others elderly pensioners or even invalids. Martin Sixsmith has a car and he needs to give a ride home to a 70-year-old pensioner who can simply no longer stand. He offers. Others are insisting on it for her, but she resists. We must stand up for our dear Borya, she says, referring to Yeltsin. <laughs> 